Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Shell with Nouvell Research. Uh, purpose of today's video is just to kind of give you an idea of a, a project we're working on here. It's actually extremely interesting to me. It's something actually we've known about in the veterinary world for uh, decades, probably dating back to the 80s. Uh, what we're looking at, what we've been doing for over a year now, is culturing out horse species. We're looking at a specific, a couple groups of bacteria, one of them being lactobacillus, uh, the other one is group D strep, uh, which includes strep bovis. Uh, doesn't mean a whole lot to the average person, but these are bacteria that are normally present in the horse's gut, hind gut specifically, going up into the cecum and whatnot. They're needed for digestion, um, for various other purposes, BFA production for energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what's interesting with this group of bacteria is, is that probably dating back to the 80s, you know, before I even graduated, we've known that bacterial shifts happen within the horse's gut due to various reasons. Um, one of the main things that they've known for quite a while now in metabolic and laminated horses is, is that in those groups of horses, they tend to have an overgrowth of strep D bacteria and lactobacillus. It's been something that we've kind of noted on the side for many, many years, decades. Um, in one case, um, people have tried to remedy the problem, but it didn't work out. Uh, there was originally an antibiotic produced uh, back probably in the 90s called Virginia Mice, and it was research oriented to reduce these counts and see if it couldn't impact laminitis. Um, didn't work out so well for various reasons, but point being is we've known this problems happen. So, what we have is, is these two groups of bacteria. They're in the hindgut, they're in the cecum, they're in other locations. They love sugar. So, if a horse goes out on the pasture, consumes too much carbs in the spring, or a horse gets into too much grain too quickly, the excess sugars drift over from the small intestine into the hindgut. These bacteria then are just like, wow, here's a big, huge food supply for me. They eat it up, they love it, they multiply in counts. As they increase in counts, a couple things happen. The pH of the environment changes, it becomes more acidic. As the uh, environment changes, it becomes more acidic, then we start to kill off other good bacteria. So the population gets really messed up back there in the hindgut. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is then we actually start to impact digestion. We create acidity issues, so we have hindgut acidosis. In cows, we have ruminal acidosis due to the same reason. We influence digestion, we reduce good bacteria, we actually trigger an inflammatory response, an immune response at a gut level, and then we can actually create damage to the hindgut lining, just the same as in cattle, to where we actually get what's called as a leaky gut type of syndrome. And then we set off this whole cascade of events with contributing to inflammation and immune problems in the animal. Now, we see this mainly right now in our research, we're looking at metabolic courses with insulin resistance and laminitis. Problem is, is very, very evident. But we're also seeing it in other cases. So, what we're gonna do here today, I'm just gonna show you a few cultures that we've done here overnight that kind of highlight and will show you the impact of the problem. Um, for those microbiology buffs out there, all these feces that are shipped into us are handled in a specific protocol. They're cultured within 48 hours of collection. Um, so they're usually overnighted. If we have samples that are here and we collect them today, we generally wait about 48 hours so everything is consistent. Uh, the feces are collected or, or sampled at one grams, one gram volumes. They are then diluted out one to 10,000 and we are culturing them out using 3M Petri film lactobacillus, um, I'm sorry, aerobic Petri film plates with aerobic lactobacillus media. And we are also using um, Enterococcus auger to uh, look at counts. Now in prior studies we've had all this validated using MRS and anaerobic conditions to make sure our petri films are telling us the truth and our Enterococcus media has been uh, put through some uh, uh, autoglutination studies to make sure that we are dealing with group D strep. So everything is validated so right now we've got down pretty much a regimen that we use and we are going from there. So we're going to focus in, we've got a variety of plates here. One of the biggest things that we use, this is our 3M Petri film plate. Uh, this is a horse that we have uh, by the name of Norman. Um, what we've got here, this is basically a combination of the diluted solution of the bacteria, plus the red is actually the growth media to get these guys, and then we are incubating for about uh, 24 to 36 hours at 37 degrees Celsius, again for those buffs. These are all post 24 hour cultures. And when we plate these petri films originally, it is a red color, and that's because of the media. And what we're looking for is that the lactobacillus, as they are in here, they will start to use this media and they will begin to change it colors through a chemical reaction and fermentation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It changes color. So the more red it is, the lower the lactobacillus count that we have. 
This plate here is basically our enterococcus media and what we are looking for is black colonies that begin to develop. And so we've got one colony here in Norman. So point being is here, this guy is on one regimen. All these horses are on the same diet that I'm going to show you here um, in a minute. They're all on the same diet, pretty much the same base regimen. But you can see this guy with the Petri film plates, we have basically a score of zero to four. This we are putting about a one plus because we do have about 10 lactobacillus colonies that are in there, nothing major. We've got one strep D colony that is developed. So he has got what we call is a low or normal count. He's actually sound, he's doing quite well, no issues at all. Now, if we move over, I'm gonna shift here, as you can start to see, we start to have increases in counts. Again, this is a thoroughbred. He's, he's fairly sound, a little bit of sore uh, uh, foot tenderness due to thin soles. He's a little bit of a stressor. But what we can see here is he's got more yellow, which means his lactobacillus count is coming up. But on the same side of the coin, his group D strep, there's no colonies at all here. Now, some research tells us that the group D stress is one of the first bacteria that begins to increase in counts, and as the pH changes, then lactobacillus starts to become a factor. I don't see that. I do see that usually we have a correlation between the two, but I've not, in our studies thus far, seen that group D is the main bacteria followed by the lactobacillus. So, this guy here, we've got it at 2+. plus. We've got another guy, thoroughbred. He's actually doing quite well, history of abode tendon a couple, two years ago, doing okay. Pretty much, again, all the same feed regimen. And we've got, and we're putting him about a one plus, and he has got about three colonies here on the group D or enterococcus media. So these guys are doing quite well. Now, we start to see the differences. This horse here is a thoroughbred same feed regimen, same base supplement regimen, but we can see he is actually what we're calling about a three to a four plus. This, this is almost completely turned to yellow, which means that his lactobacillus count is extremely high utilizing that media. If we look at his enterococcus counts, we're putting him roughly about 50. Now these big dots are multiple colonies brought together, so we're, we're guessing somewhere around 50 if we take things all into consideration. This guy here is a, is a thoroughbred, fairly large guy, history of a long-term SI problem. Um, he again is on the same base supplement regimen. And we can see that he is about a four. And he's got quite a bit of enterococcus growth or group D strep. Now, the interesting thing is, again, they are all on the same base regimen, supplement regimen, the same feed protocol. But we've got a couple of variables. A few of these guys here, we actually have another supplement going to them to help modify these bacterial counts and to drop them. It's designed to help reduce those counts and therefore try to improve the inflammatory response overall. But the kicker is between these five horses here is that we also have different personalities. And with the different personalities, we have different responses to stress. So flipping back here to this guy, I can tell you that he is on the same exact regimen as these guys with lower counts. A week ago, he had a low count. Why does he have a high count now? Because he's actually been put into more work. Now, I'm not saying that exercise is a bad thing. Exercise is a good thing. This horse's personality is one to where he's a little bit on the lazy side, he gets a little bit irritated, doesn't like to do a whole lot. So you got this stress response in him that you have to sit there and say, we're going to get over this. So we're going to work with him a little bit further and see if we can't modify that bacterial count. But again, we've got personalities that play into this. We've got responses to stress that play into this. So it's, it's pretty interesting. But right now we've got a, a regimen that we're using that is dropping these counts. But we have to tweak it with each horse in each circumstance. Okay, so we just got done looking at five horses that are here in our program, looking at the differences between the lactobacillus and the group D strep counts. Um, it definitely impacts inflammation and with the regimen that we have going now we're able to drop the counts and with that improve the inflammatory status in that horse they're performing better they're doing better now a couple of them we're still having to tweak and maybe push a little bit further with because we've got personality issues and how they respond to stress which is playing into this as well and so we've got to work with that factor and we'll get there but to highlight and to show you that this is going on in other horses 
we have a horse right here, which is a metabolic horse, insulin resistance, and Cushing's as well. Not on any of our supplements and our regimens. But what you can see here, this horse is still clinical. We've got laminitis problems currently. You can see we've got a 4 plus lactobacillus count. Very, very high. And if we look at our enterococcus or group D strep media, it's just smattered with colonies. It's just black. So if we compare this to, say, this guy over here, we've got three colonies and you can see the difference. Very low count, very, very high count. So likely in this patient here, we've got changes in acidity levels, possibly hind gut acidosis. We've also got changes in other bacterial populations, impaired digestion, and more than likely, a much higher inflammatory status in that horse, which could be then contributing to circulation and laminitis issues. Now, to go one step further, we have got a thoroughbred on the racetrack here that submitted a sample that this horse is having problems cooling down. Not really anhydrotic, but we're just having a hard time cooling down post-work. So we can see we've got a four plus lactobacillus count. We've also got a pretty significant enterococcus or group D count here. Pretty significant. Now, this horse is not metabolic. And I like to say that a lot of metabolics have this, but it goes to show that these horses in other environments, other situations, can have these changes as well. And we've seen this in a large group of thoroughbred horses on the racetrack last year when we cultured them out. And I'm not sure what the player in the game is. Is it the high grain load that they're taking in that is contributing to this? Is it the stress, the, confi the confinement? I have no idea what the factor is, but likely those are all contributors. But the bottom line, which becomes apparent, not only in our research, but in others, dating back again likely to the 80s, is, is that as we increase the growths of these two groups of bacteria, problems begin to develop. And we also have inflammatory issues that then start to uh, branch off of these issues. Um, so it's very, very interesting, and it goes to show that in a lot of cases, we have to dig much deeper in these horses to see what the factors are and to see who's playing into it and that we can't just take a horse with laminitis and say we're going to put them on a dry lot and put them on medications to control the pain when in actuality we've got a lot of changes going on at a gut level. It also raises the question at least in my mind with these two bacterial populations is, is to the use of probiotics right now in the equine industry. There's not a whole lot of research to back up the use of these probiotics and a lot of them are lactobacillus based or even enterococcus based which are pretty much the same groups as we're culturing out here. So what I don't know is, is can those um, uh, probiotics actually contribute? I don't know the answer to that. Um, it would take a lot of digging. Um, I have my own personal feelings on that which we will not discuss but um, again a lot of variables at play here. But it is something that we're investigating, something we're researching, and something we are looking to develop a solution for that can at least hopefully help some horses. But again, we got to take into consideration stress response, different personalities, and different environments that are playing into this issue. So you can't get them all, but hopefully if you can figure out the contributing factors, you can help hone it down. So I hope you guys find this interesting. We certainly do. Um, it's certainly a player, and uh, stay tuned for more. Thank you.